Have you ever been in a boring worship service? Be careful how you answer. <laughs> Listen, you have never been in a boring worship service. You may have been in a boring church service. But if you have been worshiping God, <laughs> that is one of the most thrilling, exciting, fulfilling, and meaningful things that could possibly happen to you to learn to worship God in spirit and in truth will turn the monotonous into the momentous. It is your supreme duty. It is your maximum privilege. You're going to cheat yourself if you do not listen to this series on worship. Profound Truth Simply Stated. This is Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. Would you take God's Word and be finding the Gospel of John chapter 4? And in just a moment, we're going to look at verse 24. John chapter 4, look if you will in verse 24. Hear the words of Jesus. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now look up here and let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a boring worship service? Be careful how you answer. <laughs> Listen, you have never been in a boring worship service. You may have been in a boring church service. But if you have been worshiping God, <laughs> that is one of the most thrilling, exciting, fulfilling, and meaningful things that could possibly happen to you to learn to worship God in spirit and in truth will turn the monotonous into the momentous, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Now listen to me, folks. What we're talking about today is not incidental. It is the bottom line. It is the ultimate priority. It is the highest good to worship him. It is your, listen, your supreme duty. It is your maximum privilege. Did you get that? It is your supreme duty. It is your maximum privilege. You're going to cheat yourself if you do not listen to this series on worship. You're going to bless yourself if you will drink it in, imbibe and practice what our Lord teaches about worship. Now, let me give you the background for this statement that Jesus made in John chapter 4 and verse 24 that uh, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Lord Jesus is on a journey, and I want you to notice uh, in verse 4. The Bible says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, our Lord is going uh, up to Galilee, and uh, he has been down in, uh, in uh, the southern part of the land of Israel, uh, down in Judah. And now he has turned northward, and he is going to Galilee. Now, normally, when a Jew of this day and age would go from uh, the southern part to the northern part of the land, he would not go, I say he, he would not go through Samaria. He would take a detour for two reasons. Number one, the detour was the easiest way to go down along the banks of the River Jordan where there were not so many uh, sharp and... Uh, uh, rocky uh, crags and mountains and uh, precipitous uh, places to fall. That was the easiest way to travel. But besides that, they went around Samaria, very frankly, because they did not like the Samaritans. Uh, that's to put it mildly. They abhorred the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritans returned the favor. Now, let me tell you about the Samaritans. The Samaritans rejected most of the Old Testament. They only kept five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Pentateuch. The rest of it, they said, uh, we don't have anything to do with. So they rejected primarily a good part of the Word of God. But you talk about worshiping with fervor and zeal. They still do that. They still make animal sacrifices today. These Samaritans have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Now, that's the kind of worship they had in, in Samaria. Now, the Jews... They worshiped in Jerusalem. They believed all of the Bible of that day, the Old Testament. They believed it from Genesis to Malachi. They believed it all, and they worshiped there in the temple. 
But their religion was dead. Dead as a wedge. Jesus said, Isaiah prophesied of you, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So what you had here on the one hand is uninformed zeal and on the other hand, dead orthodoxy. Now that's what you have today, folks, all around. If you look around, by and large, we have basically the same thing today when people are trying uh, to worship. The Samaritans worshiped in ignorance, but they had zeal. The Jews had the truth, but they rejected the Spirit. And uh, thank God we don't have to choose between enthusiastic heresy or lifeless orthodoxy. Now, with that as a background, I want you to look now at the Scripture. Uh, in verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain, that is, Mount Gerizim, where they were, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. That is, you've got ignorant worship. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. They had the truth. But now notice verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit, that's what the Samaritans specialized in, and in truth, that's what the Jews specialized in. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, with that in mind, I want to talk to you about worship today. What is worship in spirit and in truth? Very quickly, I hope you get these facts down. Fact number one, we must worship the right person for it to be true worship. Look, if you will, in verse 23. The Bible says, For the Father seeketh such to worship him. You must worship the right person. And who is the right person? The Father. Idolatry is to worship the wrong God. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6 says, There is but one God, the Father. There is but one God. Now we have today people who don't want to call God Father. Uh, they say they want to call God mother. As a matter of fact, some, some foolish people have even uh, rewritten the Bible to call God the Father, Mother God, and all of this uh, theological garbage. And that's what it is, folks. I hate to tell you this, but sheer garbage. God is Father. There is one God, the Father. That's what the Word of God says. Now, if, if that offends you, you come apologize to me after the service and I'll forgive you. Friend, that's just what the Bible says. God is Father. Father is not what God is like. Father is what God is. That is the very nature of God. That does not demean or demote anybody. It just simply means that God is Father. But you know what we're seeing today? A subtle move from Father God to Mother Earth. Have you noticed that? From Father, and, and beyond that, some to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Father God, to Mother Earth, to Uncle Sam. But friend, we must worship. We must worship the right person. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Did you know that Jesus called God Father more than 70 times in the Gospels? It was his favorite term for the Almighty. Now, that blesses me. That blesses me because I've been thinking about the nature of God. You, you think about His omnipotence, His mighty power, He can do anything. You think about His omniscience, He knows everything. You think about His omnipresence, He's everywhere. Somebody said that God is a circle whose circumference is everywhere, I mean whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a mind-boggling thought. Uh, that's His omnipresence. Those are great big double-jointed words. And many of us can't understand that. Many of us can't relate to that. But Father, we can relate to. Isn't that right? Father. The Father seeks us such to worship Him. I don't understand today where God goes when He goes to work, how He flings out the stars and scoops out the oceans and heaps up the mountains and runs this mighty universe. There are a lot of things about God I don't know, and that doesn't bother me. You don't know either. You don't know. He, who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath known His counselor? You don't have to know. For him to be your father. Is that not true? 
You don't have to know all that your father does for him to be your father. Little children can look to him and say, Father. And the Bible teaches that when we get saved, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So if you worship, number one, you must worship the right person. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. Number two, not only must you worship the right person, but you must worship in the right place. The right place. Now, where is the place? Well, is the place Jerusalem? Not necessarily. Is the place Mount Gerizim? Not necessarily. It could be. But what Jesus is now teaching is that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing He is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now, that's very important that you understand this. Folks, you don't have to be inside this building to worship God. Did you hear that? As a matter of fact, uh, we make a big mistake when we, uh, when we call a church a temple or when we call a church a sanctuary. Now, I guess, I say it's a big mistake, I guess if we accept it in the common parlance of today, it may not be an egregious mistake, but technically, this is not a temple. And technically, this is not a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a holy place. Now you say, isn't this place holy? Well, yes, but you're still missing what I'm saying. When you get saved, every place is holy. Every day is sacred. Any place, any time, what a privilege we have. I want you to put your bookmark there in John chapter uh, 4 and turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10 with me for just a moment. In Hebrews chapter 10, <laughs> let me show you something wonderful about the privilege that you and I have to worship our Lord at any time, any place. In Hebrews chapter 10, look with me in verse 19, if you will, please. And the Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Pastor, what does that mean? Well, when he says the holiest, he's talking about the holy of holies in the temple or in the tabernacle. Nobody would dare go in there unless they were the high priest. And the high priest could only go in once a year. And when he went in, he went in with a basin of blood and fear and trembling lest he do something wrong and God strike him dead. That's where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that was the most holy place in the temple and is called the holiest. But now he talks to us, brothers and sisters in Christ, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. How do we enter? Not with a basin of blood, but with the blood of Jesus. By a new and a living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Everything in that Old Testament temple was just a picture of our Lord. And the veil pictured our Lord. The holy place and the holiest of holies, or the holy of holies, there was a holy place, and the holiest place, or the holy of holies, was separated by a veil. That veil was about six inches thick in the temple, and, and the veil had four colors. It was white, and it was blue, <laughs> and it was scarlet, and it was royal purple. It must have been a beautiful thing. And you remember the Bible says that when uh, Jesus was crucified, you read about it there in, in Matthew chapter 27, there was an earthquake and that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. You remember that? It, it, was, it was torn asunder. Uh, so people who could never go in there before uh, could now look right in to the Holy of Holies. But this was done when Jesus shed his blood to make a way into that holy place. Now listen to this very carefully. That veil pictured the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the colors pictured the Lord Jesus Christ. White spoke of his sinlessness. The blue spoke of the fact that he's the Son of God from heaven. The red spoke of the fact that he would shed his blood upon this earth and uh, that he was a man as well as God. But if you, take, if you take the scarlet red and the blue and blend them together, you get purple, which shows his royalty. Uh, and and uh, you, when you look at the purple, 
you can't tell where the blue ends and the red begins. And when you look at the Lord Jesus, you can't tell where his deity ends and his humanity begins or his humanity begins and his deity ends. He's the God-man. That veil was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a picture of his body. And just as his body was torn on that cross, that veil was torn and made a way into the Holy of Holies. Now, folks, listen. You and I have that privilege to go into the holy place that the Old Testament Jews never had not at Jerusalem, not at Mount Gerizim. There is a new and a living way in spirit and in truth through the Lord Jesus Christ. We go right into the Holy of Holies. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. I've already been in there this morning. And I hope that you have. I hope that you know the joy, the privilege of going into that holy place. Now, worship is any time, any place that you will enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you must worship the right person you must worship in the right place. Every day is a holy day. Every place is a sacred place. You say, well then, Pastor, does that mean that we're not to come here anymore to worship? Oh, no. <laughs> if you continue to read in Hebrews chapter 10, it says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Don't ever forsake this. If you do that, you'll sin against God, for God has commanded you not to forsake the assembling. As a matter of fact, if you forsake the assembly, if you don't come to the assembly, in the Bible it is a mark that you're not saved, that you never really believe, that you've gone back to perdition. Now, coming to church doesn't save you. <laughs> Billy Sunday used to say, going to church won't make you a Christian any more than going into a garage will make you an automobile. I agree with that. Coming to church doesn't save you. But when people willingly, definitely, deliberately, carelessly, callously, Neglect the house, the place of the assembly in the Old Testament, I mean in the New Testament days, it was a sign that they'd never, ever truly been saved. They were not from us, but they were not of us. So, where is the place of worship? Anytime, any place, but there is something significant also about our coming together to worship. But now listen very carefully. The significance of coming here is not primarily that we come to worship, but that we bring our worship to church. We bring our worship. In other words, we have been, we have been with the Lord all week long. And so when we come together, all of us full of God. We don't come here to get filled up. We're already full of God. We come here to celebrate together. Why do we come together? Why do we come to corporate worship? Do you know what you're saying when you're here today, and I'm so glad you are? You're saying two things. Number one, you're saying God is important to me, and you're saying you people are important to me. My brothers and sisters in Christ are important to me. That's why we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, but we exhort one another. It fires me up to meet this man. I hope it fires him up to meet me. You blessed me today, choir, and by the way, you really did. You blessed me today, and musicians and others. As we worship, as I look out there and look at your face and those of you who are smiling and nodding and saying amen, that is a blessing to me. The Bible says we exhort one another. Now, you must worship the right person. You worship in the right place. Every day is a holy day. Every ground is sacred ground, but we still assemble together as brothers and sisters in Christ, bringing our worship uh, to our Lord. Now, here's the next thing I want you to see. We worship with the right procedure. We worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. Now, what does it mean to worship in spirit? He's talking about the, the human spirit here. He's talking about your spirit. You don't just worship God with your hands and your knees and your eyes and your mouth. That's involved. But it's got to come from within. Uh, you've got to serve God with your spirit. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1 verse 9. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. That's the reason the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is, in that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, if you don't enjoy a worship service like this, and very frankly, I know that some of you are here because somebody asked you to come. Some of you are passing notes. Some of you are reading. <laughs> Listen, I couldn't be around this long without knowing that. I know what you're doing. Some of you are planning your menu. You're out to lunch already. I know that. I know that. Hey, I wasn't born yesterday. But I'm going to tell you a problem. I'm going to tell you a problem. It's not primarily with the preaching. You remember I said, have you ever been to a boring worship service? <laughs> One woman said, I've never seen my pastor's eyes. 
When he prays, he closes his, and when he preaches, he closes mine. <laughs> hey, listen. Let me tell you something, folks. The problem is in your heart if, if worship is, seems boring to you. If a service like this seems boring to you, you just don't have the right stuff. You see, you have to worship God in spirit. And to worship God in spirit, the Holy Spirit has to be in your spirit because it's the Holy Spirit. God has sent forth His Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And if you don't enjoy coming to church, if it's tedious and tasteless to you and a bore to you and a drag to you, then nothing wrong with you that an old-fashioned revival or a good dose of salvation wouldn't cure. That's right. Worship in spirit. And then you worship in truth, in truth. Now, you don't, you don't choose the Samaritan way. You don't choose the Jerusalem way. You choose the Jesus way, which is worship in spirit and in truth. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, all that worship him in truth. That's why we always here at Bellevue have an exposition of the Word of God. Some say, oh, I just want to worship. I just want to sing and pray and praise and fellowship, da-da-da-da-da-da. And, 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 and you don't worship in truth. Real worship has a theological base, and your worship rises no higher than your concept of God. And you, you worship in spirit, but you must worship in truth. You worship the right, in the right place, anywhere, anytime, because you're a temple of God. Then you worship in the right procedure, in spirit and in truth. And here's the final thing, and listen very carefully. You worship for the right purpose. And what is the right purpose? For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. I'm sick and tired of people saying, well, I didn't get anything out of it. Well, you didn't come to get anything out of it. If you came for the right reason, you came to put something into it. I want to get a blessing. You read the Bible and find out how many times the Bible says we are to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Here's a secret, folks. When you forget about yourself and you begin to worship Him, there'll be blessings all over you when you stop trying to be blessed and start worshiping God. There's a chorus that we sing, forget about yourself and worship Him. That's the purpose of it. And this poor woman who had a thirsty soul finally found what she was thirsty for. Friends all around me are trying to find what the heart yearns for by sin undermined. I have the secret. I know where it is found. True pleasures only in Jesus abound. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Friend, there was a thirsty woman so long ago, and she met the Savior, and he satisfied her deepest longing. I know right now that there's a thirst in your heart if you don't know Jesus. Now, put away, put away your foolish thoughts right now. Don't let the devil distract you right now. God brought you here today to be saved, and if you're not saved right now, this moment, you can give your heart to Jesus and be saved. I want you to pray this prayer. Dear God, just pray it right now. Dear God, I know that you love me. I know that you want to save me. Jesus, you died to save me, and you promised to save me if I would only trust you. I do trust you, Jesus. Would you pray that prayer? I do trust you, Jesus. Right now, this moment, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Save me, Lord Jesus. Pray that from the depth of your being.
save me, Lord Jesus. Say it and mean it. Save me, Lord Jesus. Now thank him for doing it. Pray this way, Lord, I don't look for a sign. I don't ask for a feeling. I just stand on your word. Thank you for saving me. And help me never to be ashamed of you. In your name I pray. Amen.